Hello. Hi, is this Terry? <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, I was going to ask you something. Well, why didn't you? When are you going to have a concert? Oh, I don't do concerts. That's for other people alone who want to do that. Oh. You're not going to have a concert ever? No. You know, many, many people are curious why Harry never performed live. Didn't make touring a part of his career. Didn't uh, go on the road and all of those issues. And there are many, many, many answers which are interesting and valid. He just couldn't do it. I don't know it was um, fear of flying or fear of falling or, or I don't know what it was. Harry was uh, athletic, trim, cheerful, fun to be around. But Harry was the most insecure person I've ever known. He just didn't have any self-esteem. He was terrified. And I, I don't remember exactly why, but he was terrified to do a live performance. If the way to become a rock star was to make an album and then go and promote the album and then go out on tour, Harry figured, I'm going to do it another way. I'm going to find a way to do it. You don't have to go on tour. And he, part of it was about just proving that you didn't have to do it. There are very few guys that have had the success that he had without doing that. And he, he, he almost pulled it off. Well, he did pull it off. We're sitting here doing this show, this documentary. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> when he was young, he sang in the band and his fans all looked the same. And the fans he had were younger than he and he loved to scream his name. They'll leave at the end of the third show, go home to talk of the fun. Well, isn't it nice the parents would say, well, isn't it nice you got someone, someone to idolize? He must look twice his size. I think it's great. You're going through a phase. Harry was offered a BBC special to be produced by Stanley Dorfman, who was doing the In Concert series. And In Concert means in concert. That means there would be an audience. But Harry didn't do audiences. And I said he could do anything he wanted. This is not this is BBC. It's not like American television. You literally can have the freedom of the studio. Once he realized he could come and play, have more or less control of what he wanted to do, he said, yeah, why not? It's just an idea I had one night. I, just, I think it was on some kind of weirdness. The more you walk around thinking about the idea, the more permutations grow out of it, you know? I just realized it was the world's longest pun, and then I realized, God, point of sale, hmm, point of view, point of wall, you know, and all those things. The point is one of those examples that you, it just shows you that Harry is, is unique unto himself. Here was an incredible concept that he made into a musical at a time when musicals couldn't have been more off the charts. He wrote all the songs for that, and it's a great children's animation. Very, it's like one of the first children's animations I saw that was very kind of lyrical and very funny and in a weird way kind of dark, but you know, great songs. This is the town and these are the people. This is the town where the people all stay. This is the town and these are the people. That's the way they wanted it. That's the way it's going to stay. Mostly it was philosophical in attitude. Everybody had a point, a philosophical point, a point of this, a point of that. In fact, even the people were pointed people, pointed clocks, pointed cars, pointed this, houses, etc. And um, there's a little kid that's born into the society with a round head. 
and so how he's ostracized and kicked out and beat up and all. But the kid proves that he has a point without having a point. And Harry loved those philosophical turns and twists. He has a point there! <laughs> Called me up one morning, said I got to come over and talk to you. So he came over to my house in Laurel Canyon, and um, he's, he asked me if I'd like to produce him. I said I would love to, under one condition, that he had to trust me and let me call the shots, which he agreed to. One more, put it away. Put it away. Let's nail this mother to the wall. Richard's a great producer, really talented guy, and and again, a tough guy in his own way. But you needed a tough guy to deal with Harry. You couldn't, Harry could run over people. And, and a lot of people he did run over. And so he needed a counterweight, and, and Richard was that. Harry, don't smoke those. <laughs> well, come on, man. I stayed home yesterday, you know? When you walked into the studio, Richard was in charge, and it was wonderful. You know, there's like several good takes, and it's the kind of thing where if there's a great Second verse, it can be used as the first verse of, uh, you know. He had the brightness to handpick musicians and then allow them to feel at least they were free. But it, you were always being wonderfully, gently maneuvered by Richard, you see. And then there was Harry, who also you know, knew exactly what he wanted. I felt that Harry could be my Beatles, and he, in turn, I suppose, felt that I could be his George Martin which I think we did a pretty good job of accomplishing on the Nielsen Schmielsen album. That was the goal, to make as close to a Beatles quality album as possible. The first song we did was Gotta Get Up, which is the first song on the album. And like right from that opening, the way the piano starts, you could sense that this was gonna be something special. In some ways, he could be completely normal, and other times he could be totally eccentric. So, um, when, you know, once you knew how to roll with the punches, it kind of made life interesting in the studio. Brother bought a coconut, he bought it for a diamond sister hiding out a one, she paid it for the lime. She put the lime in the coconut, she dragged him boat up, she put the lime in the coconut. He played it for me the first time on guitar, and he, he just sang it, and it was just like straight through, no, no changes at all. Put the lime in the coconut, you drink them boat up, put the lime in the coconut. I thought to myself, this song really has the potential to be like a little animated cartoon. There's like at least three different characters in the song that I can think of. So I said, why don't you try using different voices? Think of the doctor saying, now let me get this straight. You put the lime in the coconut. Now let me get this straight. Put the lime in the coconut. He responded to it immediately, and um, and then you get this this marvelous theatrical performance that has made the song a classic. About halfway through the album, we had a difference of opinion that didn't sort of settle itself easily. So like two proper gentlemen, we decided to um, have a meeting over high tea at the Dorchester Hotel to discuss what we were going to do. I said, Harry, you do remember that when you came to me and asked me to produce you, I asked you, uh, my only condition was that I would have control, creative control. He looks me dead in the face and said, well, I lied. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> and then with that, we both looked at our watch and realized that we were late for the session, that he was supposed to do his vocal on Without You. Without another word, we jumped into a taxi, ran down to the studio, he went right out and sang the vocal that you hear on the record. No, I can't forget this evening Or your face as you were leaving But I guess that's just the way the story goes that was, I never stopped loving the guy, and he me. I know that for a fact. And so, you know, what's missing here? You know, why is this such a sad ending to a, what could be a tremendous story? And it's because, in my way of interpreting it, Harry, at that point in his life, developed a death wish. And um, he was successful. It took him 20 years, but he, carried it out. That was the saddest thing that ever happened to me in my life, was when I realized that he, that he, that he was in that much trouble vocally and that he didn't know how to tell me, and that he didn't want anyone to know. And it's just hard for me to talk about it. I just can't talk about it. He, I think he knew that um, you know that his voice wasn't the same. It was. I think the. I think the rejection, the failures were really hard on him. You know, it was just. It was kind of. He felt like a has been in a lot of ways, and so he turned his attention in other directions. This was a, a wonderful opportunity that Harry grabbed. We all grabbed. And Harry, the score writer, was was wonderful. Um, writing all these wonderful songs and with Van Dyke Parts to be his orchestrator and co-writer uh, for this wonderful movie, Popeye, with Robin Williams. I think it's Robin's first film, actually. Big connection and Popeye. Being in Malta, big connection. Uh, both, it's almost like being a veteran, surviving Popeye. Altman thought it was a good idea to take all the musicians to Malta which is a crazy idea, because they just, you know, they just took all the drugs in the Middle East with them, you know, and it became to have this huge party. People were lucky to get out alive. In the morning air, there's some mustard there. Blow me down. I think the first song you've ever played for was Blow Me Down, you know, and that was, so this is interesting. When you're talking like that, how do, how do you go? You know, it's like that, blow me down. And it's that he would work with it to try and, you know, give it a range, you know, that would still be a character. And that's what I, that's what I remember of it, you know, him trying to tweak it around the character, but still writing the songs. I what I am, I do it for me. Believe it or not, it's a love day, it's a perfect day. Within the song are these wonderful references, and I can't, I don't, obviously, it's so wonderful I've forgotten them, but that's appropriate, isn't it? We're talking Harry now in those times. That it was like, um, it was just, it's very beautiful. And I mean, a lot of that soundtrack is very elegant. About a month before he died, we went out on the street and we walked about half a block and there's Harry's car. 
and we got in. And he said, I just want you to listen to this with me. And he had two or three tapes. He took them out and he put them in the sound system. And we started listening to Harry's songs. And we must have listened for a couple of hours. And he played one after the other. New ones, old ones, some, some that I'd heard before, some that I knew he'd written that hadn't gotten recorded that he'd wanted to record, some that weren't finished. So they were all, but they were all wry and tender and funny and vulnerable and sweet and sour at the same time. We got to the end and the last song played and the tape player clicked and it was silent in the car and we looked around and Santa Monica was quiet. It was just me and Harry in the car. He said, well, he said, that's my life's work. He said, thanks for listening. And that's the last time I saw him.